tests when I was seven. Our next door neighbor came pounding on our front door to scream at and threaten to kill my dad because our pet that we kept in our backyard was being too loud. The pet was a rabbit. It's a rabbit. So my upstairs neighbor is soft-spoken, heavy-footed, and rarely leaves her apartment except to take out the trash. The stairs are a challenge for her. My boyfriend and I question her decision to live on the second floor. That being said, besides the creaking floorboards in the middle of the night, we have had zero negative encounters with her in the two years we've lived here. If you don't count the awkward staring we get from her as negative, I guess. She often leaves her door open, so I gather she's a religious person from the gospel to listens to. I've not had the pleasure of seeing the inside of her apartment, but I'm willing to bet the Bible has a special place on her coffee table. Today, as I was coming back from taking out the trash, I noticed a handwritten note taped to my door. At first glance, I assumed a child had written it, but the context threw me a bit. It reads, poor grammar and all. I was called to do a assignment to gather the townspeople for a public reading. Men, women, child, elder by the Most High. I didn't see any notes on any of the other doors as I was coming back from taking out the trash, so I was confused, to say the least, as to why the hell this was on my door. I walked upstairs to ask my neighbor if she had gotten the same note. I stopped halfway up the stairs and knocked on the wall because her door was wide open as usual. As she approached, I saw she was holding a clipboard and pen. The cog started turning, so I asked if she had written the note. With a blankness in her eyes, she shook her head yes. In an attempt to be as polite as possible, I asked her where the public reading would be held. She stared down silently at the note in my hand for a gut-wrenching 15 seconds. I felt my heart drop to my stomach, but kept a smile. Finally, she replied in a whisper, I don't know. At this point, I am thoroughly shook. In the sweetest tone possible, I said okay and started to walk back downstairs. With my back turned, I heard her add, When it is time, you will know I'm sure. My heart was racing as I went back into my apartment and locked all the doors. Why I locked the doors, I have no idea. Her words made me feel unsafe. I called the main office of the complex to explain what just happened and was informed that multiple residents had made the same confused call. The landlady asked our neighbor the same question I did and received a similar ambiguous answer. My so boyfriend thinks she is losing her wits due to her sedentary, solitary lifestyle, and that might be true. All I know for sure is that we are currently living beneath a woman who barely speaks and believes she has been chosen by her God to do a public reading that he, she, they, it has not yet determined a date for. I'm feeling away. Probably more than I have a right to feel about this for someone who doesn't have all the facts. Has anyone here had any similar encounters? What was the outcome? If the date and place is set, do you think I should go? Update. This morning I heard a crash outside my door. From past experience I could pretty safely assume that she was throwing her trash bag down the stairs as she does to save effort. But considering our talk yesterday, I decided to look through the peephole just to be sure she didn't fall down or anything. I was right, no alarm to be had. But I let curiosity get the best of me and couldn't take my eyes away from the door. After she cleaned up any mess she made, she sat down on the bottom step to catch her breath. I realized at this point that if I back away now, she will hear the creaky floor and know I was watching. I was stuck. I could stand there for some indefinable amount of time until she gets up and leaves, or I could open the door to have another conversation. The second I opened the door, she apologized for the noise. I told her no worries and that I was only concerned she may have slipped and fell. As I was closing the door, she apologized again, this time for our conversation yesterday. I said she had nothing to be sorry for. Again, she apologized and tapped her temple as if to say, this brain's not what it used to be. Let me reiterate that she is not an elderly person. With all that said, as soon as I know she's not within earshot, I'm going to be making a wellness check call. Thank you all for your input, concern, and advice. Much appreciation. I dealt with a stalker a little over four years ago. It was a terrible experience and last I heard that guy was living in another state, but for the past few weeks I have discovered a man lurking around my house in the middle of the night, and I just saw him again tonight. I don't know if it my old stalker or someone new. 
For a few weeks I have heard small noises while smoking outside at night, like rustling bushes or car creaking or a small scrape on the pavement. It scared me, but I tried convincing myself it was just a cat and that I'm being paranoid. I rarely go outside by myself anymore, and if I do, I bring a big knife with me. I have a baby daughter now and am not about to let anyone get in my house. A few weeks ago a cigarette disappeared from my ashtray outside, and it wasn't windy or anything. The next night I saw a silhouette walking up the street, and when it got to the bushes at the end of my driveway, it didn't emerge from the other side. Through the bushes I could see what looked like a man's silhouette crouching, and I ran inside scared as hell. I told my fiancé immediately, he went outside to look and didn't find anyone. He said it was most likely a nosy neighbor and for me to not worry. Needless to say, I put more locks on my baby's window and door than a maximum security prison. Tonight, I really needed a cigarette and my fiancé was asleep so I got my trusty knife and braved it. I heard the car clicking and thought maybe the cat jumped on it. The cat ended up being inside. I kept my knife ready and stared at the car for what felt like a long time because I was too afraid to move. That's when I saw the outline of a head through the rear window pop up from behind the car and quickly duck back down. I about had a heart attack. I sprinted inside, and I heard a foot scrape on the driveway, as if the man were either running away or towards me. I didn't take the time to look back, just ran inside and locked the door and turned the lights off. It's 3 a.m. now and I'm too afraid to sleep. I've contemplated calling the police, no matter how much I hate them, but I'm sure they won't do anything to help as I have no evidence. In a way I'm hoping it is just some random creep or nosy person, because if it is my old stalker that could end up being very bad. I don't know what to do here. I'm not sure who it is, I'm too afraid to do anything but run away, we're too poor to move, and I'm terrified of something happening to my daughter. Any advice would surely help. So this took place some years ago, but it still creeps me out to this day. I was staying with my then boyfriend at his apartment on the lower level. He had what seemed like a really cool neighbor. We will call him Dan. Well, Dan was a heavyset middle-aged man around 40, white, and didn't have any kids or a wife, etc. He liked younger girls, though, and he liked to pay them for their services, you know, the ones similar to Backpage, but only post-Backpage days. So my boyfriend one day decided to joke with him and said, well, if you like to pay, how about my girlfriend shows you her boobs and you pay both of us? As he laughed it off because he could feel my piercing stare directed straight through him as if to say, yeah, you've lost your damn mind. My boyfriend knows I'm not that type of girl and never have been, so I'm guessing that was what made it all the more funny to him. But anyways, one night, Dan asked my boyfriend to take him to the store for beer, and he did. Well, at the store, there was a clerk. She was a pretty little petite, blue-eyed, blonde-haired girl, around 22 years old, that Dan liked but was too shy to approach. So my boyfriend, trying to be a wingman or something for Dan, was able to get her number for him. Well, a week or so goes by, and Dan comes and knocks on the door and tells my boyfriend that the clerk will call her April agreed to come over and hang out with him once she got off work. Dan didn't have a car, and neither did she, so he paid my boyfriend gas money to take him to the store to pick her up. We all rode to go pick April up, and she came over, and we were all talking and drinking until they decided to retreat upstairs to Dan's apartment. She stayed overnight with him and left the next morning, so I'm assuming she rendered him some services that night because the following morning Dan was super happy and telling my boyfriend about how he enjoyed her company the night before. Well, this goes on for about three weekends, and let me say this. From my interactions with April, I could tell she had some sort of habit drug, alcohol because she would appear inebriated every time I'd seen her. And not that I'm judging because I'm not, and I kind of didn't blame her. She was doing the shit strictly for the money and no pleasure. Dan was way out of her league, and he knew it. And she wasn't sexually attracted to him, so she felt she had to be high or drunk after to screw him. Dan seemed really nice but he just had something strange about him that I couldn't pinpoint exactly. Well, it started to get old to April to the point Dan had to beg like hell and offer more money for her time. So she agreed to another nightly tryst, but it would end differently this time, and April had no clue what was to come. We picked her up as usual, and they went straight to his apartment. 
A couple of hours go by, and we can hear knocking and banging upstairs, you know, like the sounds of people having hard sex. My boyfriend proceeds to comment, Damn, he's F-seeking the shit out of her. Then we hear running and loud stomps back and forth on the floor upstairs. Not knowing what the hell is going on, we hear Dan yelling, One, two, three, counting. At this point, it was really starting to piss me off to where I was going to tell my boyfriend to go knock on the damn door and tell them we're trying to sleep. But then, a moment later, all was silent. We fell asleep only to be woken up by siren lights. We were oblivious to what was going on, and it was late, so we went back to sleep. So the next morning, we found out Dan was taken to jail for the murder of April. Come to find out that strange thing I couldn't quite pinpoint that was weird about him was his sadistic fetishes. That night, Dan had tied April up with a cord, binding her feet and hands together, and putting a collar or some sort around her neck as well to choke her and restrict her air supply. He left out of the room for some reason, leaving her to suffocate to death. The sounds of counting we heard were him trying to do CPR on her lifeless body. My boyfriend believed it was an accident simply because he felt Dan was a nice guy and didn't seem like the type to do something like that, but I beg to differ. I feel he was falling in love or obsessed with her and knew he couldn't have her, so he wanted no one else to be able to either. It just goes to show behind smiling faces they can mask pure evil. Dan will never see daylight to be able to do this to another woman again. Sometimes I think if only my boyfriend would have never gotten her number for Dan, she'd still be alive today. But then I think no, it would then only have happened to another woman instead. So this happened a few months ago and still genuinely freaks me out. So my work involves proving an in-home service, so a lot of my day is driving to my clients' homes. I have one client that lives about 30 minutes from me in a very rural area. Anyway, I left my house at around 11 a.m. to get to this client. At a stoplight about 5 minutes from my house, which is in the middle of a heavily trafficked city, the car in front of me turned their left turn signal on, so naturally when the light turned green I drove around them. After I passed them, I noticed that the turn signal was turned off, and, and instead they went straight and were now behind me. Thought nothing of this at the time because who doesn't get confused about directions sometimes. So I keep driving down these backcountry rides that are not heavily trafficked and the car continues to follow. After about 20 minutes I started to get more aware while this car could very simply be going in the same direction as me. I just found it a little off their route was matching mine exactly. When I finally got to my client's house and made the turn into the driveway, I fully expected the car to keep driving. But nope, they turn into the driveway behind me as well. The driveway was narrow, thus they were essentially now blocking me in. I turned my car off and waited a few minutes, and the car behind me stayed on and didn't move. The windows were tinted so I couldn't see inside. I sat in the car waiting, and the person in the car behind me didn't get out. They just continued to sit there, car running. I called my client and asked if she could come stand on the porch so I could get out of my car and she happily obliged. The minute my client stepped out on the porch, the car very quickly backed out and drove away. The client did not recognize the car. I have no idea why it happened. I didn't do anything to cause any sort of road rage, so why this car suddenly started following me is very bizarre. And if was something sinister, why do it midday? Anyway, it's just been on my mind for a while and thought I'd share. I really have no explanation for what happened, which is probably the most frustrating part. I was in my early 20s and living at home while attending graduate school. I was dropped off home at night after a date with the man who later became my husband only good part of the story. My parents were in the living room with my older brother Eric and I went upstairs to hang out with my two younger sisters, Sarah and Laura, in the room they shared. The three of us, I'm sure, were talking about my date and other sister gossip, when suddenly there was a thump-like noise at the window. Sarah and I heard the noise but didn't really pay attention to it, but Laura was closer to the window and walked up to it and opened the blinds. Suddenly she screamed, and when Sarah looked at her in the window, we saw why. Staring back at us through the window was a man's face on the second floor of the house no less. Seeing this man, Sarah and I both screamed as well, and the three of us ran out of the room and sprinted downstairs, screaming there was a man in our window. 
My dad immediately ran outside alone since my brother Eric had some leg injury and was in a brace or cast and was unable to join him. After a few minutes my dad came back in and told us he didn't see the man or anyone at all, but there was a ladder laying on its side right under my sister's bedroom window. My dad called the police who came pretty quickly and searched the area themselves. They didn't find much, though they did notice footprints leading into woods behind our backyard. Unfortunately, they really couldn't do anything else to find him, though they did patrol the area for a while. Since it all happened so fast and the three of us ran out of the room right away, we didn't get any sort of good look at the man, not to mention it was dark out. Thankfully, though, we never saw him again. However, about 15 years later, I was now married and had three kids and lived in a house not even 10 minutes away from that house I grew up in. I worked as nurse in a hospital, and one day there was a horrible snowstorm. The roads were awful and cars were snowed in. Me and a co-worker didn't feel safe driving, so we got a ride with another co-worker, whose husband was picking her up and had a nice van that was better to drive in snow. Not far from my first co-worker's house, we saw an older man, looking like he was in his late 60s, walking alone. Our driver pulled up and asked if he was okay and the man said his car was stuck or something in the snow, so he just decided to walk home since it was just about a mile away, if that. We nicely offered him a ride since it was so close, which he accepted. When asked where he lived, it ended up being the very same street I grew up on, a bit of a ways down the road since it was a long road, but still effectively neighbors. I commented this, saying how I grew up there and my parents sold the house a few years earlier, he asked which house exactly, and I told him. He looked at me and said, You lived at XXXX? Wasn't that the house that had a man looking in the window? Taken aback, I said it was. He replied, Oh yes. I remember reading about it in the newspaper. It was never in the newspaper. I already knew that, but I even checked with my parents later that evening to be sure. The man looking in our window was never in the newspaper or on the news. My feeling is this man was the peeping Tom. The man we were giving a ride home was the same man who I saw staring into our window 15 years before. Now, obviously that could be considered quite the leap to make, but hear me out. First of all, it wasn't in the newspaper. That was simply not true. While it's possible this man simply misremembered how he heard about the story and assumed it was in the paper, I don't buy that. While it was extremely creepy and memorable to me and my family, was it really that memorable for a neighbor quite a few houses down to have it be the first thing he recalled about the house 15 years later? I don't think so. There wasn't any yelling or screaming outside of the house. There was no noise like a gunshot or fighting. Nobody was hurt. Nobody was arrested or even accused. The only thing that would potentially be memorable for a neighbor was the police being called. And even then, all they did was walk around. They didn't chase after the man or bang down a door. And again, this man in the car didn't even live next door. From his house, maybe he'd see flashing lights, but that's really it. So yeah, I'm 100% convinced this man was the same man in our window all those years ago. I think me saying that's where I lived at the time gave him some sick pleasure, remembering what he did and wanted to see my reaction. Thankfully, I didn't have much of one in the moment since I was so surprised he brought it up. After he said he read it in the newspaper, my only response was saying something like, oh really, and that was it. A minute or two later we thankfully reached his house, and that was the last time I ever saw him. I wish I could I say I confronted him on the story not being in the paper and pressed him, but I didn't. The thoughts I now have obviously didn't come to me in the very short time we were together in that car. But after thinking about it later and talking to my parents, I was convinced. I asked my dad if he knew the guy at all, and all he knew was the guy's name and he was married, at least at the time when we lived on that street. Obviously we couldn't exactly do anything about it, though my dad and brother would say they'd like to go confront him about it. Now all these years later, it's something my siblings and I will occasionally talk about and even laugh about a little bit, like teasing my brother about being unable to go look for him. Though it doesn't change the fact that it was a genuinely terrifying night. My sister Laura, who opened the blinds and was essentially face to face with him, still to this day pins her curtains shut at night and keeps her blinds closed at night and refuses to look out of the window when it's late at night. And even writing this over 35 years later gives later gives me a bit of a chill, 
especially talking to the man in the car 15 years later. If I'm right and he was the creep, how often did he watch us through the window? Was the only time or just the final time? I won't say I'm happy he's no longer alive since as sure as I am, I can't really know it was him for a fact. But I certainly don't feel sad about it either. I'm still pretty jarred from this experience, but I figured it would be easier to share about it than keep dwelling on this. A couple days ago, someone broke into my house while I was asleep. I work night shifts so sleeping during the day is something you learn to get used to. Around 6.30 p.m. I heard what I thought was a loud knocking sound coming from outside and my dogs going absolutely ballistic. For reference, I live on a farm out in the middle of nowhere. My closest neighbor is a half mile away. But back to the story. So somewhat wake up, but don't really think anything of it since my neighbors like to shoot their guns, and this was during hunting season. As I start falling back asleep, my heart started fluttering weird like I knew something wasn't right. That's when I heard loud footsteps throughout the house. The dogs are still barking but start to quiet down. That's when I really begin to worry. When I think my dogs would protect me in a time like this, fat chance. The footsteps stop on the other side of my bedroom door and doesn't move. I think this is how I'm going to die and although I had a weapon in my room, I knew I couldn't get it without being heard. It felt like an eternity before the steps moved around and towards my brother's room. Rustling can heard loudly through the house and things being thrown. I knew they were in my brother's room. Some of his friends are into seedy situations and I knew it had to be one of them. So I heard the footsteps coming back to my door and the doorknob handle moves. I immediately turn my back towards the door and close my eyes tight, a hand over my mouth to stop from screaming. The door opens but that's it. Then he leaves as a car drives down the road. I finally bucked up my courage and get out of bed. Everything in the house except for my brother's room was undisturbed. I immediately called my brother and asked if any of his friends were coming over. He said not that he knew of and I told him what happened. He got off the phone with me to start calling around. I went back to bed and noticed that I still had my window cracked over from earlier and realized I had my sheet off of me wearing only a t-shirt to bed if it was who I think it was. This wasn't a random event. One of my brother's friends has always had eyes for me, and the fact that he saw me sleeping and in just a t-shirt makes me freak out. Whether or not he took something out of my brother's room or knew I was home alone sleeping before having to work later that night, I don't know. I'll post an update when I hear from my brother. You move out to the country to get away from the activity of city life and let your guard down. That's when something like this happens. Sometimes country life isn't so safe after all. Update. Sorry y'all for the late update. It's been a crazy week. But thank you for bearing with me. My brother got back with me with news I absolutely dreaded hearing. None of his friends said or claimed to have been at the house at the time of the incident. So now I'm even more afraid of who was at my home and what their intentions were. They could have been scoping out my house during the day now that my county has decided to extend the gravel on my road that connects to the farming community I live near. I just hope I don't have another visit like that anytime soon. But if there is a next time, I'll be sure to ready for them. When I was in fifth grade, my family and I went to New Mexico a lot because we were born there. I really liked spending time with my two cousins, Tony and Paul. When we were at their little house in Posos, we would play soccer in their backyard or watch TV. When we weren't doing that, we'd be playing with our Legos, trying to see who could build the weirdest structure. One day, we were playing a game we made up called Pine Cone Wars. Then the neighbor and some of his family came out of their house. Their house was right next to Tony and Paul's place. I think the neighbor's sister was talking with my mom. All of a sudden, the boy from the neighbor's house walked up to us and said hi to Tony and Paul. Paul introduced my brother and me to him. Let's call the boy Owen. We shook hands and right away my hands started feeling tingly. I found it strange. I think Owen was two years older than me. We played pine cone wars until my grandma called my brother and me for dinner. So, oh, by the way, the rest of my family was there too. After eating, I went to the couch and played Legend of Zelda on my Game Boy Color. Because my grandma's neighborhood was pretty safe, she didn't have an alarm system. That might explain what happened next. 
My brother and I had to go to bed, so I slept in the guest room. I left my Game Boy on the couch. Suddenly, I heard the door opening quietly. It felt like my heart stopped for a moment. I lay there frozen for a minute until I finally pulled the blanket over my head. I heard heavy breathing at the side of my bed, and I put my hands around my nose and mouth to cover my breathing. Then I heard footsteps leave my room and I couldn't sleep at all that night. The next day I found a note on the floor. The note said, Hi Lily, good luck sleeping tonight. Next to the note was a freshly cut rabbit's paw. I screamed so loud that the neighbors probably heard. My mom rushed into the room and saw the note in Rabbit's paw. Her face turned pale, and it looked like she wanted to throw up. After a while, my grandma came in too. She got a pair of gloves from the garage and used them to throw out the Rabbit paw. I didn't feel like eating after that, and I didn't eat the whole day. Also, I never found the Game Boy after that. I didn't feel safe there at night anymore, so I asked my family to lock the doors this time. But in the middle of the next night, I heard a knock at the window. My bed was right next to the window, so I had no choice but to look out. When I did, I saw Owen standing there, giving me this really big and kind of creepy smile. It made me feel uneasy like something wasn't right. I didn't know what to do at that time. And then I saw him trying to open my window. He noticed it was locked and went away, but I was still too scared to go to sleep. Four years later, I heard the news that Owen is in prison now for doing something very bad to a teenage girl. Whenever I remembered what happened that night, I thought about how close I might have been to being his victim. For context, I live in a subsidized housing complex for people with disabilities. With the exception of one guy with cerebral palsy, everyone here has something psychological going on. For the most part, things are pretty quiet. Us mentally ill types having too much going on in our own brains to really bother anyone else, and we tend to keep to ourselves unless there's a holiday party in the common room. I've been here about five years now, and I'm not sure I've even met everyone. It's a couple of odd things that do go on. There's one lady who wears long sleeves even in the middle of summer because she thinks spiders will come after her, will wander the halls knocking on doors asking if people can spare any tobacco or papers. Not in itself too odd, except that she bangs on the doors really loudly and yell through the door you got any papers? At two in the morning. She doesn't bother me since I don't smoke, but she often goes to the guy next door, and her voice carries all down the hall. Now the guy next door. Generally a pretty quiet fellow, but when I first moved in I felt a bit uneasy because a couple of times, there was a guy outside his window yelling that he wasn't going to go away until he let him in. Have no idea what that was about, but I haven't seen or heard him in a couple years, so I guess they sorted out whatever it was he was after. But a few months ago, I heard some yelling outside my door and a woman screaming, No, neighbor, stop. When I looked out my peephole, I saw his caseworker walking away comforting an upset-looking older woman. It's not old enough to be his mom, maybe a sister. Haven't heard a peep from him since. There's a guy down the hall who moved in a few months after me. One time at night I heard banging and just figured it was the guy next door hanging up pictures or something. Later I was walking down the hall and the floor was littered with bits of particle board-like material. He'd taken a hammer or something to his door and busted a big hole in it. A couple weeks or months later, my girlfriend and I saw him outside swinging around what looked like a golf club with the club part broken off. We called his caseworker, she called the cops, and he spent a couple days in the hospital. He's been pretty quiet since then. Then there's the guy on the top floor, he's a real oddball. Wears a baseball helmet pretty much all the time, really ratty clothes, some of them repaired with duct tape. One time at a party he was talking about how he died once and talked with the devil. She's one of the people Spider Lady asks for tobacco. Not long after I moved in I saw him outside the store, doubled over with cops asking if he was okay and on any medication. I wished I could have helped but at that point I didn't even know his name and figured I would have just been in the way if I'd tried, so I kept on walking. His mom used to bring him meals every week or so, but she passed away recently. I feel sorry for the guy, he's got a lot to deal with. Other than that, things are pretty tame here. They're a very quiet woman with Tourette's down the hall. She smiles at me when I greet her in the hallway, but rarely talks. 
A guy on the top floor plays accordion and you can hear him practicing when you walk down that hall. The guy directly across the hall from me has schizophrenia. He comes over every couple weeks to share a meal or a drink with me. Very mild-mannered man. Seems a lot older than he is. I would have guessed 50s, turns out he isn't even 40 yet. He's actually pretty intelligent, but you have to talk to him a while before you realize that. He seems heavily sedated and talks about very mundane stuff like new clothing or his daily 30-min walks, often repeating the same topics over multiple visits, but every now and then you can get a real intellectual conversation about science out of him. And there's a guy around the corner who's really friendly when we meet outside the building that likes to talk to me about gardening since I have a couple planters outside the front door and his dad used to have a greenhouse. I haven't heard it, but apparently he yells at himself in his place. I can't really judge him for that because I do the same thing myself sometimes. So yeah, not really creepy, but it's definitely eventful. In Chicago, I lived in a small complex with three apartments on each side, split up by a stairwell. I lived on the third floor and have a few stories about messed up neighbors. I was in my late teens in beauty school and my two best friends who I lived with were in college so naturally, we had parties, came home late, etc. We lived in Lakeview, which is a pretty loud and young neighborhood in Chicago, not to mention we lived in between a bar and a Mexican restaurant that had a full mariachi band a couple of nights a week, so it was never quiet. So our downstairs neighbor was this super mean old lady who'd always complain about us with passive-aggressive notes, which she'd always say us to make it seem like she lived with someone else besides her cat. She was super standoffish because we'd always offer to hold the door for her if we went into our building at the same time or say hi in passing while taking out our trash down the stairs we all shared going down to our back porches, and she'd always just straight up ignore us or say something mean. So we had an exposed brick wall that ran up all three apartments which looked cool but was awful for us because she took dumpster plywood and boarded up the entire thing, which led to a disgusting, almost two year centipede infestation. She also put newspaper over all her windows. I felt bad for her because she was clearly alone, and I'm sure we were annoying as heck young adults, but it was a neighborhood meant for young people, and all attempts at kindness were rejected. So we started to notice one day that the hallway smelled weird, and after a week it started smelling pretty bad. There was a super nice older couple that lived across from her that would check on her occasionally, so I think they were the ones who called the cops she died, which started to smell, and her cat started to eat her due to lack of food. After they cleared out the body and removed all the plywood off the brick wall, we no longer had a centipede problem. I feel really bad for the poor lady because she died alone and angry. Second story. One Halloween, my roommate and I went out to a party close to our apartment, and our other roommate was going to stop at home, then meet us there when she got off work. So when she got home, she saw a young kid, maybe about eight, nine, with blood splattered on his clothes. She thought it was a Halloween thing until he started crying and screaming, then heard the couple on the first floor screaming and fighting, so she called the cops, and apparently the girlfriend stabbed the husband which sprayed blood on the kid. The dude lived but still. Chicago is a crazy place, even in the nice burbs. So my boyfriend and I had just signed for our current apartment, we walked around the block and we came across this house that is right behind our building. The front yard is covered in junk, like everything political signs and religious signs and random gnomes. They have a shrunken head type thing on a stick. It was early October, but I don't think it was a Halloween decoration. You literally cannot see the ground, it's all just stuff everywhere and completely overgrown. There is a giant cross and Bible verse painted on the side of the house. There is an impossibly beat up, rusty old car parked in front. He has a Trump flag hanging on his porch, which is super tattered. So when we moved in, we discovered we can see their backyard from my window. It's worse. There are open umbrellas covered in holes lying around, ladders leading to nowhere, hunks of appliances and chairs just strewn about and at least two big German Shepherd dogs that are kept outside and never brought in. They bark constantly. I don't know how people haven't called the cops and filed noise complaints. They literally bark all day every day, I am not exaggerating. 
One day my boyfriend goes outside to our little balcony on the fire escape and I'm still inside. Suddenly he opens the door and whisper screams babe. Babe come here quick. So I run outside thinking it's like a cute animal or something. But no. It's the neighbor and it's the first time we've seen him after a month of living there. He was sitting on a giant bike thing. But it had three wheels like a tricycle. He was in the middle of the street. Just sitting there. He had some sort of religious sign taped to the back of his bike tricycle, and he also had a license plate mounted to it. He was just this old dude with a big belly, long white hair, and a long white beard. He was wearing a helmet and just sitting there in the middle of the damn road. He wasn't moving. He wasn't even looking around. And we just stood there and watched him like what the F is he doing? We probably watched him sit there for a good ten minutes. Then, ever so slowly, he turns his bike or trike and starts pedaling back toward his house. We lose sight of him when he goes behind some trees. My boyfriend joked that he was a wizard and was trying to apparate, but I just found him really creepy and unsettling. I haven't seen him since, and if I ever have to walk past his house, I cross the road to give myself a wide berth. Growing up, it was my best friend's parents. He lived down the hill from us, the parents, sometimes the grandparents and three boys. And at various times, cousins and other family members, eventually the boys' wives, girlfriends of the boys also would live there on and off. I was down there often for games D&D, HeroQuest and console, movies and our local karate club. When we're old enough, I would hang out at the diner where my friend work and then do whatever. Then head home, typically his place and chill there with his girlfriend or with mine if we were dating at the time. That's all cool. The issue is that HSI family was strung tightly and were heavily armed. They loved me if I had called down that someone was breaking into my house. I am confident that every single person in their house would be armed and running to save my ass in 30 seconds flat. We would be playing PS or whatever and my friend would drop the controller and say, you hear that? Yeah, it was a neighbor getting home. By the time I would get that out, he would have a shotgun and be by the door. It was always a neighbor. They had guns everywhere. I had more guns pulled on me than I care to remember. Were they loaded? Probably. But it was always a joke. Ha ha. The kicker was when we were 18 or 19, my friend, his girlfriend, and me came back to his house. Maybe two in the morning. I would say typical for us. Come into the living room, then into the... Other living room, I guess maybe sitting room, and the father comes barreling downstairs in a rage. Screaming ensues. Continues. You're late. Your mom. I was worried. Eventually. And this is the part I remember clearly. I almost shot you. I would have killed my own son. Then because I love Oyu so much, I would have had to shoot myself. How could you do this to me? His mom steps up. I am thinking she will breathe some rationality into this situation. I was wrong. Her contribution. Yeah, then after watching my husband kill my baby son and then himself, I would kill myself right here too. Again, this is screamed. So me and his girlfriend look at each other. And just leave. So many, many other issues. One cousin was turning tricks, I think. Offered me sexual favors for cigarettes. She was like 14 or 15. People were constantly married and divorced. I often didn't know who was who. The father was arrested for sitting on a gun while stalking a guy who was maybe stalking his daughter-in-law, I think. It was confusing at the time, too. For all that, loved hanging out there. Probably not the smartest idea. I have a neighbor that lives adjacent from me. We share the same alleyway where garbage and waste is temporarily stored. Anyways, the owner of the house is unknown since our family moved in in 2006. Visitors who are in their 20s to maybe 50s constantly enter the house and exit, and it can get shady at times. So cars are really parked on the driveway since the oldest son's moved out. If there is a car is a shitbox Toyota or something. I always avoided putting anything on their lawn as my younger sister was playing on it, and an old woman threatened to hurt her. The lawn is unkempt and full of weeds and dry grass. Not entirely creepy, but many questions are yet to be answered. I 
I have a really douche or sketchy neighbor who would smoke a cigarette outside his house almost every day. One day, my brother and my Mexican foreign exchange student were playing soccer in our backyard, and the ball went over the fence. Apparently, he wasn't happy about this whatsoever, and so he grabbed his golf club and threatened to hit them with it. From what I can recall, they went inside crying and let me tell you, my mom was pissed. I've never seen anyone get that angry in my life, even to this day. I was driving along one night near my house in Hunts Point and stopped at a stoplight. Yay, I know, bad idea, blah blah blah. Needless to say, what happened next boggled me. Some black dude my neighbor came up to my car and knocked on the window. He told me his friend was in the alley and injured. So, being a good Samaritan and all, I got out of my car and into the alley. Suddenly, he whispered not to move in my ear, so I tried to move and then felt the dull side of the blade against my throat, so I just did what he wanted. As he finished his deed, he looked into my eyes and said, You owe me tree fitty. It was about that time I noticed this dude was about 500 feet tall and from the Paleolithic era. Knowing about this phenomena from the internet, I yelled, God damn it, Loch Ness Monster, I ain't gonna give you no tree fitty. He then swam away as I pulled a gun out of my car and shot at him. When my sister and I were about five and six, we lived in a small town community about 600 people, and we would frequently play outside without parental supervision. Our neighbor would, unbeknownst to our mother, take us to the local ice cream shop for ice cream. One day we moved without explanation. Years later it was told to us that that neighbor was a registered S offender and PDF and mom moved for our safety. She freaked out when she learned about our trips to the ice cream shop. To my knowledge neither me or my sister were ever assaulted, but it is still very scary to think about. I used to live in an apartment a few blocks from the beach, off one of the main streets in a beachside city in California. A new whiskey bar opened downtown and my neighbor's daughters invited me to go check it out. We had a great time, maybe a little too great a time, and around two in the morning we decided to head home. We weren't wasted, but all three of us were definitely drunk. I requested to walk home since we were only around one five miles away, and I was feeling too dizzy to take an Uber. It was also fairly easy to get home as we only had to walk a block up from where we were to be back on the main thoroughfare I lived on. The entire walk home was well lit along a busy thoroughfare with cars passing regularly even at 2 a.m. My friends agreed to walk home as they were both also feeling tipsy, and we all felt the walk would help us sober up a bit. We were walking along, laughing, and about halfway home when one of my friends quietly said to stay calm and not to look, but there was someone following us. We immediately shut up but kept walking. My friend quietly told us he had been following us for the last few minutes. She had been waiting to tell us anything because she wasn't certain if he was following us. A few minutes later and we were all 100% sure this guy had been following us and we would be back to my apartment soon. The entire time the creepster was following us, maintaining the same distance about 100 feet back as so we couldn't see him enough to identify what he looked like and we were afraid to call the cops because we weren't sure what he would do if he thought he saw us calling the cops. The cops wouldn't have had enough time to show up and find this guy that we couldn't identify. We were almost to my apartment and discussing our options. We knew we didn't want to lead this guy back to where I lived as he might decide at a later date to come back. Calling the police was still out because he was still near enough to see what we were doing. Everybody was asleep, my friends didn't live there, and they still had to get back to their car so they could get home. We decided to keep walking past my apartment and turn on a side street going down the opposite block to mine. As soon as we knew that we were out of sight of the creepster, we bolted around the next corner and took off running as fast as we could to get as far down the street as we could. Our intent was to loop back to my apartment without the creep seeing where we went. At this point, we didn't know if he saw what street we went down, we wanted to make sure that he wasn't still on the main street, so we ducked behind a car towards the end of the street we were on and waited. Maybe about 30 seconds went by, and I popped up to check the end of the street from the direction we came from. Sure enough, 
The creep was at the end of the street looking around to see where we went and seemed out of breath from running. He did not see me. I told my friends and we took off running down the end of the street and around the block as we were now near enough to my apartment that we could run in, and the man wouldn't have enough time to catch up to see where we went. Shaking and terrified, we collapsed onto my couches and waited an hour or two to make sure the guy would be truly gone before my friends left and went home. We felt very fortunate that our friend caught the guy following us as soon as she did. It was really scary to know that the cops wouldn't have gotten there in time, and that a lone man was willing to take on all three of us. We didn't call him out for following us because we figured anyone crazy enough to follow three chicks at one time was probably up to no good, and was not going to be worried about us noticing. We felt very fortunate that nothing happened to us that night. Hate it. I did offer for my friends to stay on the couch that night, but they wanted to go home and sleep in their own beds. As we were all sober by the time they left, I didn't push them to stay. Friends don't let friends drive drunk. I've just had a creepy experience, well more to the point my neighbor has. It's 10 p.m. here, and I'm in my kitchen getting a drink and looking through the blinds as the car park is busier than its usual deathly silence. I live in a first floor flat overlooking another small block and a two-story masonette. As I'm watching, a security light on the street comes on, and a gentleman is walking up our usually quiet road. What caught my attention was his hood up and mask pulled up over his face outside in the dark other than street lamps. So I watched as the car left the car park, and the gent made a beeline for the corner bottom flat and cut through the bushes to stand nose first to the front window. He stood there in the dark, just looking through the blinds. He stood there for what must have been two minutes in the dark, peeping in. After a short time, he walked around the side of the flat near the main door. Then, just as quickly as he had gone round, he came straight back into the bush at the front and nose against the glass peering in, this time for around three minutes, just in the dark, intensely staring into a young couple's home, before turning and starting to walk back out of the car park. Thinking this is really odd behavior, having walked straight to the furthest flat, indicating a target or victim, I grabbed my shoes and ran out and down the stairs to see if I could get a closer look at him or his clothes, just in case he came back. So when I got outside, I could see him down the road, walking into a side alley. Where I live, you can either go down the side alley or round a few houses, and it brings you out at the same side road with another dark downhill alley. I ran the opposite way to him and turned the corner as he was going down the second alley, proceeding to follow him down the steep side way. I saw him turn the corner, but in the twenty-foot distance he had over me, by the time I turned the corner he was gone, must have hopped a fence or hid. He was nowhere to be seen. I ran back to my car park, jumped in the car, and drove around the block a couple of times with no luck of seeing him. Overall, a very odd experience. And super stalker-like behavior. I did let my neighbors know that they had a peeping visitor, by the way, and left my car facing the open car park so my dashcam can run just in case. Also, it made sense when I knocked on the door why he came back round from the side so quickly, because the kitchen window blind was up. I don't know if I'm being paranoid, but I think someone has been watching my family at night so I'll try to be brief as possible and stick to the relevant events that are giving me this feeling. But the latest event happened last night, and I didn't get much sleep, so apologies if I ramble or am unclear. So my wife and I recently purchased our first home after the birth of our daughter. Everything was as you would expect the first few months. Painting, decorating, renovating, basking in our newfound slice of the American dream. You get the idea. Unusual things started happening several months ago. One day as I was getting home after work, I passed by a strange truck two or three houses down from ours. I say strange for a few reasons. We know literally everyone in our small neighborhood, and I'd never seen this truck or person before. There's no reason for through traffic to come down our street, and the truck was driving very slowly. Like, put it in drive, but don't press on the gas slowly. As I pulled in the driveway, the truck flipped a U-turn and came back towards my house. Sitting out of my car, the truck crawled by and the driver stared daggers at me as he passed, then sped off. I don't like to judge based on appearances and I like to think that I don't scare easily, but something about this guy's eyes gave me a bad feeling. 
Obviously, this was weird. I mentioned what happened to my wife, telling her we should be more mindful about security. When I told her the type of truck, my wife said, that same truck drove by and the guy stared at me when I got home this afternoon. I thought he was just being creepy and checking me out. I tried to tease her a bit to lighten the mood, calling her cocky for assuming any guy driving by was checking her out. I didn't want to freak her out, but I was definitely freaked out. She saw the truck a few more times over the next couple of weeks, either driving by slowly or parked down the block and facing our yard. But one day the truck stopped driving by and we haven't seen it since. I sort of dismissed the whole thing as me being paranoid. Then other things started happening. In the past month or so, my wife and I have been hearing tapping on the windows at the front of our house at night. It's happened two or three times to each of us separately, always around 10 or 11 p.m., and always a soft but distinct tap, 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 tap. It sounds like knocking with a single knuckle on the metal part of a screen door, if that makes sense. The first time that my wife and I heard the tapping together was last weekend. We were in the front room playing with our daughter around 9.30, just about to settle her down for bed. Our front room has a large, almost floor-to-ceiling window running the length of the wall next to the front door, which faces the street. We were all sitting on the floor with our backs to the window, reading our daughter a book when we heard it. Tap, 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 tap. So, our house is older. Creaks and cracks are not uncommon. But this sound was so distinctly intentional that my wife and I immediately looked at each other and bolted up out of the room. I had my wife and daughter lock themselves in a back room while I turned on all the lights and did a sweep around the outside of the house. Of course I didn't see anything and was ready to dismiss the whole thing as more paranoia over something that probably had an innocent explanation. Until last night. It's around 9.45 we heard our daughter making noise in the baby monitor. I waited a few minutes to see if she would settle down, but when it became clear she wouldn't I got up to put her back to sleep. The layout of the room is important to visualize this next part. This room is on the side of our house, but the exterior wall juts out a bit in an L shape, and the corner of this L is made up of windows. If you're standing in the door to the room, you're directly across from these windows in one corner, and there's a rocking chair in the other corner pointed towards the front of the house. One window faces the street, and the other faces our neighbor's house, a garden bed planted with small shrubs wraps around the outside of the house directly underneath. I was sitting in the chair getting my daughter settled down. I had a lamp on so the room was softly lit. Once she fell asleep, I stood up to put her in her crib when something caught my eye. There was a figure standing about a foot away from the window in the bare space between the shrubs and the house. They were staring at us. They didn't look long enough to see anything more than what appeared to be a man in a light gray hoodie standing a few feet away on the other side of the glass. Sprinting from the room, I brought my daughter back to my wife and I's bedroom, leaving her there while telling my understandably confused wife to lock the door. After turning off all the lights inside the house and turning on all the lights outside, I began moving from room to room. Peering out the windows into the darkness, I couldn't see anything out of the ordinary. Whoever it was must have taken off after seeing me notice them and make a quick exit. Obviously, I had some trouble sleeping after this. I spent hours checking security cameras and going from room to room looking out windows into the night, hoping but also not hoping that I would see anything that could explain what happened. This morning I went outside to the spot where the figure would have been standing. I thought hoped maybe there was a plant or something that I mistook for a person. When I got to the spot, I realized the figure had to be standing exactly in a bare patch of ground about two feet in diameter, directly in front of that window. Part of me is still hoping that I'm being paranoid. The mind can play tricks on you in the dark, seeing things that aren't there, especially when you're a sleep-deprived new parent. But with everything that's been happening, I can't shake the feeling that there was actually someone out there last night, watching us. Please let me be wrong. Update. Didn't really expect my post to blow up like this, but I really appreciate all the advice and support from everyone. I tried to respond to as many comments as I could, but at this point there are so many I figured I would just provide a quick update and address some of the more common points people have brought up. As for the update, nothing happened last night. I expected that would be the case for a couple reasons. First, so far all of these events have taken place a week or two apart. 
The tapping this weekend and seeing the figure two nights ago were the closest in time of any of them. Second, this person absolutely realized I saw them, so I wouldn't expect them to be so bold as to come back the very next night. I still stayed up and kept an eye out though, to address some of the common questions, comments, or advice. We own several guns. I am well versed in gun safety, and a pretty good shot if I'm going to brag on myself. Since we have a young child, I have kept all weapons locked away. But after this past week, I've made sure to find places to store guns that are out of her reach, but within my reach for quick access. There are blinds, curtains, and solar screens on all our windows. The window in the story is dark, and the curtains were drawn over it that night. They're those semi-see-through white ones, so I didn't notice the blinds weren't drawn. All windows are checked and covered as soon as I get home from now on. So all our exterior doors are deadbolted and the frames are reinforced. These were security measures put in by the previous owners that I thought were unnecessary, but am now grateful for. Anybody tries to kick their way in, the door will hold long enough for me to get ready for them. I have purchased and installed additional exterior cameras with motion-activated lights. I am looking into buying additional motion-activated floodlights for the more remote corners of our property. Lots of people have mentioned getting a dog. While I love dogs, we have a pretty full house animal-wise right now, and I wouldn't feel good about taking in another animal that I wasn't sure we could give sufficient attention to. Our neighbors have two very alert dogs that are out all night, and they have been barking more often after dark the past few weeks, which is another reason we've been on edge. As for who this person might be, I don't think it's related to the previous owners. They were a married couple with no children who lived there for over 30 years. The husband died and the wife needed to downsize, which is why she sold the house. Maybe it's someone who lost out on their bid for the place, but there was so much time between us buying the house and all this starting that it seems unlikely. Several people made note that I said I was a lawyer and asked if it could be related to that. My practice is focused on probate and estate planning, and the vast majority of my cases or clients do not involve any contentious issues or drama. Obviously, there have been some cases that get heated, but I can't think of anyone that would want to come after me specifically based on any of them. I took some pictures of the place where the person would have been standing and the view they would have had inside the house. It got me spooked all over again for sure. If I make a separate update post in the future, I'll consider including them. Thanks to everyone for taking the time to read and provide advice. If anything, I feel much more prepared to keep my family safe should this person come back. If anything happens, I'll update with a separate post in the future. This story occurred a few years back. I would have been around eight or nine at the time. So my old bedroom sat facing out towards the street and also happened to be right next to our front door. It was very small as it had been built in place of our old front porch. The roof was slanted slided downward toward the window, which took up most of the wall and the bed could only fit in one way. It was painted purple, not a nice purple either, like a kid's bedroom of course. So my bed sat facing towards the door to my bedroom, parallel to the window. A closet took up part of the corner between my bedroom door and the window, making for an unjewel space. Every night I checked to make sure the curtains were shut all the way as the idea of people watching from the street made me very uncomfortable, even at a young age where things like that shouldn't even cross my mind. Every night I slept soundly, no nightmares, no sudden noises waking me in the middle of the night, nothing. That was until the middle of the year during a school break. I remember waking to the sound of someone breathing. I couldn't move, couldn't catch my own breath, I was just stuck. I remember so clearly seeing a man stood in the corner of my room, stuck partly behind the curtain as if it would hide him. Of course I could see him. He was just this dark entity who stood and watched. After what felt like hours I was able to get back to sleep. In the morning I told my mum about what had happened, and she explained it was just a strange nightmare and that I was fine. But the way she said it wasn't very believable these cases of sleep paralysis went on for about a year, taking me up to the middle of the next year when I was likely eight or nine. I remember waking in the middle of the night, just like I had most nights for the last year to the man in the corner. Only this time, I could move. I stayed absolutely still, despite now knowing he was actually there. 
I could hear his faint breathing like he was trying to hide from me as much as I was trying to hide from him. I couldn't help but think, has this man been here every night this year? I remember the thoughts I had. How I'd run out of the room and scream for my mum, how she'd call the police, how this man would be arrested and sent away. But I couldn't do that. He was basically in front of the door. I spent the night staring at him, trying to fall asleep. I'd say it was around 5 a.m. I was able to drift off, just sort of as the birds started to wake. I woke up and lo and behold, he was gone. The first thing I did was tell mum. She already looked uneasy like she already knew. That's when I heard two people talking outside. I found out later the people outside were my neighbor and a police officer who was taking an eyewitness statement. It's around 6 in the morning our neighbor spotted a man standing outside my window. She called the police but he was gone before they arrived. Other neighbors stepped forward saying they'd seen him outside in the middle of the day, looking at our house. There were no signs of forced entry, only two footprints in the flower bed outside my window. My mother told the officers my account of what happened, and they came to the conclusion that he'd done the same thing last year I saw it, and it sparked my tangent of sleep paralysis. The street light outside projected his shadow so it appeared as though he was stood in my room. This whole time he'd been waiting patiently outside my room. Who knows what would have happened if my neighbor didn't spot him on her way out for work. Just a few minutes and she could've missed him entirely. A few months ago, a man was arrested for looking through my window while I was nude or in a state of undress. I lived in a busy part of the city, but my complex was small in a corner and not well lit at all. It was very much an, I never thought this would happen to me until it did scenario. This man was only caught because, by a stroke of luck, my neighbor whom I had never really met, only said hello to a couple of times had seen him and called the cops from inside her apartment. The policeman who arrested him knocked on my door afterward and was very kind to me. Until he told me that this man had been arrested for this upwards of ten times and basically told me he was harmless. And here's the kicker peeping in my state and maybe elsewhere. I'm not sure if this is a state or federal law is a class C misdemeanor, meaning that every time he did this, they booked him and charged him with a $500 fine, then let him go. That's it. After that, I became even more hypervigilant. There were a few times that I heard somebody knocking on my door, but when I looked through the peephole, I couldn't see anything. I'm a true crime junkie, and I definitely became paranoid. Looking back, I'm very certain that it was the same man knocking to see whether I was home or not. I feel confident in saying this because the detective assigned to my case let me know that the beat cops in my area caught him lurking near my complex after another neighbor called the cops because he was freaking her out and something seemed off. This gets even weirder because even before the original arrest, I remember hearing knocks on the windows at night and came home a few times to see my patio furniture looking like it had been rearranged. It didn't seem sinister, just a little off. I moved out of that place a couple of months later, and I've only just begun to put the pieces together that all of these weird occurrences are probably connected. I feel very confident that this man was lurking nearby for a longer period of time than it seemed, and I have no idea what his intentions were, but they were certainly nothing good. Thankfully, I've graduated university and moved to a city 60 miles or so away, but I still get chills thinking about it. This morning I was asleep and heard knocking on my window. At first I just thought maybe something was hitting my window, but then I heard our storm door open. I was hoping and thinking it was my parents. Then I heard the knocking again about ten minutes later, so I woke up my parents to check it out. My dad opened the door and there was a man who didn't speak much English asking for a girl named Delissa. He then parked his car in our driveway and started walking to other houses. My dad then told him he needed to leave. My dad also saw that there was another guy in his car, and they had open containers. When asked, they admitted to knocking on my window. I'm pretty sure they were just looking for that girl, but that was very scary for me because I just needed to sleep, and I had no idea who was at our house. I live in a densely populated city. About a month ago, I was walking home from work one night. Many times I find myself walking back a little later at night, like 10 or 11 p.m. 
That's about the usual time that I get done with work. I walk right to a park on my way home and I enjoy it during the day, but when it's nighttime, it always seems a little spooky. One time I was walking home from work, going down the path in the park, and I got a call on my cell phone. I looked, but it said, unknown caller. I ignored it and kept walking. This is something that I probably would have just forgotten, but the crazy thing is that it happened again the very next night. I was walking home and it was right around the same time as I was going through the park and my phone rang again. It was also from an unknown caller. This time I declined the call and kept walking. The very next night I found myself walking home at night again, and once more my phone rang as I was walking through the park. This time I was curious as to why this kept happening and I answered it. When I said hello the first thing that I heard on the other end was the sound of somebody breathing as if they were right up to the phone. They didn't say anything, though. I asked who this was, and at first I just kept hearing the breathing on the other end. Then they spoke. It was a man's voice who said, I can see you, in the creepiest way possible. He continued, I watch you walk through the park every night. I asked again who this was, then he said, Look to your left. I was standing on a path that was going right through the park, and to the left there was a bench. The bench was empty, but behind the bench there were a few really thick bushes. I looked in that direction and at first saw nothing. Then I saw a man starting to step out of the bushes. I didn't stop to get a good look at him. I just started running. I remember when I began to run, hearing some laughter from the man. He didn't chase me. I ran the quickest way possible out of that park and back onto the sidewalk. Then I hung up the phone, which was still on the call with the guy. I walked as fast as I could the rest of the way back to my apartment and looked over my shoulder literally every five seconds. In the days that followed, I took a taxi to and from work. Eventually, I started walking to work again, but I still avoid that park, especially at night. This creepy older guy, who I believe was in his mid-fifties and named Peter, used to live next door to my family. At the time we lived in a duplex and he owned both units so he was our landlord. I was too young at the time to remember this now, but my mom says he used to let himself into our unit when we weren't home and look through all of our stuff. One day my mom found out and absolutely lost it on him. He also had a parrot that died of old age I believe, but he insisted that my dad poisoned it and started threatening him. This crazy bastard actually got an autopsy done on his parrot we moved into a place across the street, and a couple of years ago when I was about 12, me and a buddy were in the front yard when he just walked up to us and started talking about his parrots and how he drives a school bus. I've always been a bit paranoid so I was way on edge, but my dumbass friend was totally interested in this creepy guy's story. Luckily, my buddy's mom came out and Peter left. To this day I still see him now and then, but he hasn't given us any more trouble. We used to live at a location I christened the corner of crack and pipe in a rundown apartment house. We used to joke that the apartment besides ours was haunted as no one seemed to stay there very long. So one day this couple moved in. We rarely saw the female of the pair, but the male seemed to hang about the place coming and going frequently. Shortly after they moved in, the guy met me on the stairs and said, oh, you must be your significant other's girlfriend and proceeded to chat to me, telling me he knew my boyfriend and acted like an old friend. Later that night I asked the significant other how he met our neighbor. He said he didn't. He thought he was my old buddy. Apparently the guy read our names on the mail we had unlocked mailboxes downstairs and played like he was an old bud to both of us to pump the other for intel. One day we came home from a day trip to find the house surrounded by cop cars. Apparently Mr. Goodfriend was dealing drugs while his Whatever relation she was, was turning tricks to supplement the household income. I had to turn away a couple of her late night returning and slightly drunk customers seeking blowjobs for a few days after they were arrested. So when I first moved out on my own, I couldn't afford anything better than a rundown duplex in a kind of shady neighborhood. Most of my neighbors were druggies. The landlord would let them skip out on rent sometimes if they fixed up the house. 
so at 3 a.m. they'd be banging on the walls with hammers, so that was fun, but not the best one. My favorite was the lady who moved herself into my garage. I had a truck parked outside the door, so the door only opened about three feet or so. This lady had moved in a sleeping bag, a fan, a small television, and all sorts of stuff. She only left at night, and at the time I was working and going to college, so I was exhausted all the time, so I didn't even notice. My bills started going up, not by much, just enough to be noticeable. I couldn't figure out why. I had barely been home, so I was using less utilities. One day I wake up and my backyard is flooded. Like several inches of water, but I knew it hadn't rained. I checked my garage and sure enough, there was running water. I was barely even mad that someone had been living there. My first thought was, you've been staying here for free and can't even bother to turn off the water. Anyways, I waited outside that night and caught her. She was probably 40-ish, clearly high as a kite, but didn't really look homeless. Not really sure what it means to look homeless, just saying she looked taken care of told her politely to be out of my garage in the morning. Around 7 a.m. she had a big black truck outside and was throwing her TV in the back complaining about how she'd been there for three months and couldn't believe she was getting kicked out. This guy lived across the street alone, in his mid-fifties, single in a large home which was odd to me. What do you need that much space for? And my dad was always friendly with him, so I always assumed he was nice enough. He wasn't always there. He had another home somewhere else, I think. It was always kind of odd, but I never thought anything of it. One day, I came home to see cops searching his property that really freaked me out, and I still never knew why they were there. I even checked local police reports. The dude moved out of his house shortly after that and the photos for the real estate listing were creepy, almost like he hadn't moved anything since 1990. I always wondered if he was secretly hiding people in his house, but I will never know. Last year, a guy with some kind of psychosis not familiar with the jargon, sorry, he may have been schizophrenic, psychotic, or something similar decided to come live alone right below us. The first time, he came to our door dressed only in a robe and filthy boxers reeking of booze. Imagine a guy much like the bald pirate from Pirates of the Caribbean, the friend of the guy with the glass eye. He asked to come in and keep company with my girlfriend. It took a month for things to escalate, him reaching the point of threatening to kill me with a screwdriver and wanting to have sex with my girlfriend in the elevator, banging on our door and screaming profanities, etc. The police couldn't do much. They needed a signed report from relatives to take him in as dangerous. The guy was taking meds with too much alcohol. So we contacted his brother who lived in another city. The guy said, I'll talk to him. Please be a bit patient. He is leaving in four days, but if he comes again, by all means, go to the police. Indeed, he left, and a week later, they found him dead. Cardiac arrest or something. I feel bad that my first reaction was cheering. His illness was not his fault. But on the other hand, we were really in danger. While living off campus during college in an apartment building, I noticed that all the mailboxes were incredibly dirty at first. One night, I was out late and came home to see the neighbor at the mailbox. I assumed he was just getting his mail. Upon closer inspection, I realized there was semen smeared all over the mailboxes, I had no clue why he did that, so I called our landlord the next day. It stopped for a while, but then he started smearing it on our doors. Eventually, I got tired of it and confronted him. He apparently had some mental health issues and told me he was warding off the devil for us. With no clue how to respond, I just began opening and closing everything with a napkin. About ten years ago, an older man moved into the house next to me. Our backyards connected, and he had a beautiful white dog that I loved. The dog always seemed sad and lonely, and after one of my cats passed away, I would sit outside and spend time with the dog. Then one day, the dog wasn't there. No one had the courage to go over there and ask if he was okay, because the guy had been harassing my mother about where she left the garbage cans, so we were afraid of him. Finally, my uncle went over there and asked what happened to the dog. He told my uncle he had killed the dog. 
We were all really devastated, and when my uncle threatened to call animal control, he reneged and said he didn't kill the dog. Soon after, the man moved away. The first thing I did was hop the fence and play CS, I looking for any evidence that the dog might be buried there. I looked all over and found nothing. I still regret never having the guts to ask him if he wanted to give us his dog since he never seemed to care about him anyways. have a two fur from the same place. Before we married my wife and I rented a condo for three-ish years. We were on the second flood of the condo and our neighbors to the west were married with four or five kids. He was a doctor, she was a nurse that worked in his clinic which he operated in the downtown area of our small town. Doctor and nurse seemed overly nice, but their kids were disasters. They would bounce rubber balls off our garage. We couldn't put potted plants anywhere outside because they would basically use the flowers as target practice for their ball playing. Their youngest child had autism and he was a super sweet kid, but they always seemed to treat him like a second-class citizen compared to the rest of their children. Abruptly, they finally moved out and my wife who is nosy and several other nosy neighbors from the condo association toured their apartment afterwards and it was a mess. Smelled awful, junk left everywhere, soiled mattresses left behind. You have to wonder how six, seven people live there. We also found out from the other nosy neighbors that the nurse accused women in the neighborhood of trying to seduce her doctor husband without reason. So my wife being nosy, as she has looked up their medical practice online and discovered that the doctor had his license revoked, his clinic shut down, and that was likely the reason they left town. So the other neighbor lived down below us. She was nurse too, worked long hours, had a nice big friendly dog, seemed fine. Nurse too and my wife bonded over the weirdness that were the doctor and nurse, and she was always pleasant and friendly. We lived in the condo for about two years and really didn't get to know her much beyond that. Then, one warm fall weekend, she invited us to hang out in the common backyard and have a fire, so we figured, why not? Grabbed some beers and hung out with nurse too and got to know each other better. Things started off normal enough, finding out more about jobs and family and whatnot. Then talk turned to sports and nurse two remarks that Brett Favre is her boyfriend. Ha ha. We live in Wisconsin. This happened when Favre was still the man for the Green Bay Packers, and most women of nurse two's age in the state would probably make similar remarks. Then she continued that on Sunday game days she would call the coaching staff of the team at halftime and tell them what they needed to fix to do better for the second half of the game. Ha ha. Oh wait, no, she was dead serious. She went on about how the team would suddenly start doing exactly what she told them to do over the phone. She really, truly thought she had some sort of direct line to the Packers head coach. Okay, kinda weird there. But then back to her boyfriend. She starts talking about how Favre was obsessed with her, trying to call her at all times of the day, wanting to be with her. She asks us if we ever see a truck in the condo parking lot late or night or early in the morning, because that's Favre looking out for her. Our master bedroom overlooked the parking lot, and we never, ever saw the vehicle she described. She claimed that she finally had to tell Favre that she couldn't be with him because she was married, and that he needed to focus on the team and the game, but that she would always love him. This whole time I'm uncomfortably listening to her and trying not to say anything to upset her. She continues, adding that she has gotten into trouble at work because of Favre. She apparently got into a shouting match with another woman at work after she joked about her non-existent relationship, and she basically threatened this woman. How she didn't lose her job, I'll never know. Soon after this, my wife and I wrap up the evening and head inside and try to piece together what the hell we just experienced. Nurse 2 said these things so matter-of-factly it was really creepy. I still wonder, was there ever a truck in the parking lot? Did she really call someone on the phone and who was it? Or was it simply all a delusion? We never did hang out with her again, although we'd see each other from time to time and exchange pleasantries. Brett Favre was never brought up again, thankfully. Someone a street or two down from me had a 19-year-old son. Just a teen, nothing seemed suspicious. Then one evening I come home from work, and it is a madhouse in the neighborhood. Police everywhere, bomb squad, the whole place was barricaded, and it was chaos. 
I didn't even get back to my house that night, it was so bad. And this was a large neighborhood, a gated community. So it's not like only a few houses were blocked off. It was several streets of homes you couldn't get in at all, unless you lived in a whole other side of the gated community. As turns out, the teenage neighbor had purchased a huge amount of acetone from a pool cleaning company. Apparently, there was another huge amount of chemicals, too. Someone from the company was suspicious of this and tipped him off to law enforcement, which led to a raid of his parents' house. It turns out he had enough chemicals to actually blow up the entire gated community. They found bottle rocket bodies, PVC piping, bridge wire, and all sorts of crap in his bedroom. For days on end, we had cops circling the area and news reporters outside the community, people down the street being interviewed. A few nights later, law enforcement had taken all of the chemicals that were removed from the home and took it to a remote area to blow it up. I was just sitting there watching TV and the explosion started. Things shook, something fell off the counter and broke. My pets went into defensive stance. I could have sworn that the explosions were happening on the next street over. That's how unbelievably loud this shit was. I thought, oh hell no. I remember calling the neighborhood security and saying, um, that sounded awfully close, what should we do? They assured me that the explosions were happening in a very, very remote area miles away. Yep, that's how huge these explosions were. He was arrested and held for a while. His lawyer tried to make it seem like he only needed those chemicals because he's into boats, and his life is all boats and everything was a big misunderstanding, and he's a good boy. It's cut to about seven, eight years later. The guy is well known in the local community for being a douche canoe. He hangs out at a local bar and brings obviously underage girl with him. He has been arrested once or twice for buying alcohol for underage girls and has been tried for statutory R. He's been fired from a bunch of places and can't hold down a job. There was a report where he had apparently whispered death threats into a 12-year-old's ear. You know, good boy type of stuff. Except, not even most douchebags have purchased enough chemicals to blow up a community 15 square miles large. Something tells me that his privileged, white bitch boy status helped prevent him from being labeled as a terrorist. The current neighbor. Mid-50s, lives in a dilapidated home with an overgrown lawn. So the story is his father died years ago, and this guy wears all of his clothes, so his style is anywhere from Mr. Rogers to Veller tracksuits. It wouldn't be so bad if all he was guilty of was interesting fashion choices, but he's done some strange things. Like plant a tomahawk in another neighbor's yard, she's an attractive woman. Sweeps his sidewalk at like 2 a.m. and the sidewalk is never clean despite all that. Wanders around with gardening tools saying he's got to maintain some properties around here. And frankly just gives off a bad vibe. I've asked the police to keep an eye on him. Dude weird me out, but all the other neighbors seem to have grown accustomed to his behavior. One of my current neighbors. I moved into this flat about a month ago and have come across three of the other four neighbors on my floor, either just passing in the corridor or had a parcel delivered to their flat when I wasn't in. But the guy next door I hear him grunt and sigh occasionally, which is how I know they're a he never seen. I don't work currently, I have an ongoing illness, so I'm in most of the time, but I've never heard his front door go to suggest that he's exiting or entering nor do I hear anyone go round, even though these are small flats and I can hear my neighbor on my other side coming and going, as well as the postman knocking on everyone else's doors. Assuming his flat is the same floor plan as own, his bedroom shares a wall with my living room. When I'm sitting on my sofa, I can hear creaking kinda like a mattress or creaky bed frame through the wall, on and off at all times of the day. So, a man is definitely alive in there, but what does he do in bed all day? My immediate thought is that he is also disabled, but how is he getting food? And if he's bed-bound, who is caring for him? The first house my parents owned, into which I was born, was in a rather nice area, but happened to be next to an outlier. A halfway house that had come about through a noble but misguided bequest. 
By and large, the guys, all men who came through in the time my parents were next door were, I'm told, very good sorts. They were basically good people who had made mistakes, paid their debts to society, and were absolutely thrilled to be living in such pleasant surroundings. It was run, it work, strictly on a referral basis, so that only parallels who were ready and suited for this kind of environment were sent there. It wasn't a very professional operation, just a place for decent guys coming out to live and adapt back into good society. Then a guy with a rather darker past, but fairly promising social skills managed to wangle a referral. He was only there for about a couple of months when I was barely a year old, but my parents said they were immediately on their guard around him. Then the body of a little girl not much older than me showed up in the lane way between the houses. New guy went away for a long, long time. My parents moved, and the halfway house was shut down. When I was a kid around eight years old, I lived in a somewhat sketchy neighborhood. Many of the houses were trailers perched on top of hollow concrete foundations, and the real houses needed some repairs. One day, a new neighbor moved in. She was a couple of years younger than me, and for privacy's sake, I'll call her Ellen. She constantly joined in on whatever I was doing and came over to see if I was around without any warning. There weren't many nice kids in the neighborhood, so I understood to an extent where she was coming from. However, she didn't seem to share the same idea of fun. A lot of my memories from that time are somewhat fuzzy, but here's what I remember. Ellen was very aggressive. She would get angry if I ever told her no, and almost every time I visited her house, I could hear her screaming at her parents and later her dog. She was generally very loud and seemed to enjoy making me flinch. I've never been a fan of loud voices when they're unnecessary. I would also find things missing from my room, only to see them in hers. Items like friendship bracelets, stones I had found, and small toys littlest pet shop anyone. Whenever I pointed them out, she would go silent and let me take them back, staring at me as if I had wronged her somehow. She unnerved me, to be honest. When we went frog hunting, there were a few times she pulled the legs off our frogs, and her dog seemed scared of her. I'm almost sure they took it to a shelter, so I really, really hope it's okay now. I'd also sometimes find dead birds and squirrels on my front steps, their legs, heads, or wings missing. They were all over her yard too, but she blamed her cat. I never saw a cat, and I remember hearing a couple of different names for it. I can't be sure it was her, of course, but a little voice in my head thinks so. My cat definitely killed mice too, but she never did it so brutally before or tore off any pieces. She'd run into my mom sometimes when she was looking for me, and my lovely mother told me she had asked to come in anyway and wait in my room when I wasn't there. The answer was always no, for pretty obvious reasons. Our fence to the backyard was high, and there was no way to climb it which I learned the hard way after the gate locked behind me, home alone with locked doors and no key. It was about six feet tall, made of nice new wood, with a latch only on the backyard side. Our trash and recycling bins were about 10-15 feet away by our front shed. We started finding them right against the fence, and eventually my mom caught Ellen peeking over the fence when she was out back cleaning our little pool. I also found Ellen lurking by the fence coming home from school one day when she was supposed to be sick. Being around her always gave me a horrible feeling, as if doing something wrong or mentioning what I'd caught her doing would lead to something bad happening to me. We moved away about a year and a half after she moved in, and I have no idea what has become of her now. I hadn't thought about Ellen in years, but driving past the old neighborhood a while ago brought it all back. I've got plenty of other stories to share, though Ellen won't be making an appearance in them. I'm a 22-year-old Brazilian male from a really small town, and in 2018 I moved to the capital of my state for study and work. In these five years I never had a sight of a creepy encounter or even a robbery, but last Friday I had the worst experience of my life. At the start of 2020, I moved to this apartment complex. I live on the first floor of the first block, 
which makes the space behind my bedroom window a common area. And in these three years, same thing. All peace, no robbery around, not many people walking behind the place looking inside, except some internet provider technicians and a trustful neighbor who eventually walks behind to make it to his bike faster at the start of the day. People tend to ignore us living inside. They would pass just minding their own business, talking to me only if I was in a different area of the apartment a little porch in our living room. I currently live with two friends from my old town and my girlfriend. Last Friday, one of those friends went back to our town, leaving me, my girlfriend, and the other friend alone in the apartment. So around 3 a.m., me and my girlfriend came home from a bar we like to go to every Friday. At this point, it was all normal. We came, ate something, took a shower, and rolled a blunt like normal couples do. In that time, my friend came home around 3.30 of M, making the situation even more secure for us, as usual. We invited him to smoke some weed, which he denies because he was tired, so we decided to just smoke and go to my bedroom to have sex. During the deed, we hear some strange noises but end up continuing. In some moment, we want to change the position and hear again the noise of something sliding. So I looked at the windows and saw a guy's face, practically glued to the window bars watching us. I have a very short temper, which leads me into Berserk mode, instantly breaking the window glass with my bare hands. I was really pissed and ran to the kitchen to get a cutting knife while repeatedly screaming, I'm going to kill you. When my adrenaline subsided, I managed to calm down and called my mom to say I was going to stay at her house for a few days in my old town. We are very scared and suspicious of the neighbor upstairs, as we saw him in the same place earlier, and I could recognize scars from freckles on both the window face and the face from earlier. However, without confirmation, we are left in an extremely uncomfortable position, not knowing exactly who the person is and him knowing exactly who we are. He knowing we were going to be late, knowing where we live, etc. About the dude. The guy we suspect was seen in the same spot earlier picking up weed ends. He looked into the apartment and chuckled. He's my neighbor upstairs, he doesn't work, he doesn't study, he just listens to music all day, does drugs. As I have insomnia, I can often hear him arranging lines of cocaine and then snorting. I hate the way that shit makes me feel. so my fiancé and I have been on the lookout for a kitten to accompany our three-month-old kitten we have already. We searched and searched until one day he said to me, let's look on Craigslist, so I did. We found the perfect one, but the only problem was it was two hours and thirty men away from our home. I inquired about it at around 10.30 p.m. I know it was late. But almost immediately I got a response. She sounded very nice over text and asked to see where I lived so that she would feel settled about the kitten living with us. She also insisted on going to their house, I know. I should have just dropped it at the time I thought nothing of it. So I sent them a video we sent up a time for the next day to meet. Next day came I wasn't going to take my fiancé, but he insisted on coming with me because he wanted to be my protection in case since Craigslist is sketchy. So we drove two HRS and 30 men on our way there. As we were on our way, I was texting this girl that we would get there on time, and she responded, Great, see you then. We arrived to the home, me in the driver's seat and my fiancé in the passenger seat with the window down. I texted the girl and I got no response, I called and no response. I ended up calling five times and texting in the course of an hour and no response. I went up to the house and knocked on the door. Nothing. There was a car in the driveway, but no response from the number or the door. We got there at 6.30 and waited until almost 8. Nothing. The neighbor came out asking what was wrong. I said I'm here since I inquired about a kitten, and she said, A kitten? I said, Yes, it was an ad on Craigslist. She said, No one has kittens in this home, though. I showed her the ad, and she said, Oh, I know them. They are very sketchy people, and they don't own any cats, I just helped them move their furniture yesterday. So I said, well on their ad, it says that they have to get rid of their kittens since their new place doesn't allow pets. So the neighbor said, 
That's impossible, I have a dog and so does the next door over. I immediately found this creepy and assumed the neighbor was also in on something since it was too creepy and I was feeling anxious. I thanked her and left along with my fiancé. Literally immediately when we pulled out of the street I got a text from the girl saying, I'm just now getting your messages, something must be wrong with me phone. Did you still want the kitten or no? I didn't answer and we headed back home. What I don't understand is they didn't get any money from me, but they asked me to show up not knowing I'd be with my fiancé. I had a bad feeling about it. What did they want from me? I've never only started thinking about this in the last 10 to 15 years, but I think I narrowly escaped being s assaulted a or murdered as a kid when I was a preteen growing up in rural Texas. A family from Las Vegas moved next to us. It was Harry, his real name, and his wife, her mother, two daughters, and one of their husbands. I was drawn to them because they were very friendly and interesting. All except Harry. It didn't take long to figure out that everyone in the family hated him. He gave off a real dirtbag vibe. The family had money, but it came from his wife's side of the family. He didn't really fit in with the rest of them. Over a year or so, I spent more and more time over there, but avoided Harry like the plague. Talking to his stepdaughters, I learned that their mother was getting ready to divorce him. I think he could see the writing on the wall, too. One day out of the blue, he stopped over at my house. I was outside, riding my bike or something. He asked me if I wanted to take a ride with him to check on their cattle. For some stupid reason, I forgot all of my misgivings about him. I thought it might be cool to take a ride with him out in the country to check on the livestock. My mother was inside talking to a friend on the phone. I'll never forget how she reacted when I asked her if I could go with him. Without interrupting her conversation, she mouthed no and shook her head to reiterate the point. She told me to just go to the front door and shake my head, rather than going outside and telling him I wasn't going. Harry just shrugged and left. After his wife finally kicked him out, Harry started harassing them in weird ways, creeping outside their house at night, and even calling in fake obituaries for one of the daughters into the local newspaper. Thankfully, he took off back to Vegas soon after. After I had kids of my own, I started thinking about that incident and what could have happened to me that day if my mother hadn't had the foresight to tell me I couldn't go. I think Harry would have hurt me just to get back at his family members who had a fondness for me. It's chilling to think about. Leaving my friend's house, I accidentally backed into a brick mailbox. My bike rack hit the mailbox so my car was okay, but completely demolished the mailbox. No big deal, right? That's why we have insurance, right? I went to the neighbor and told them what happened, and gave them my insurance, phone number, and name. All I got was his first name. From the get-go, this dude was creepy. He kept hitting on me, trying to date me, specifically trying to feed me. I left on my drive to my mom's I'm attending out of state college and parents are divorced the guy I backed into Robert began to text me and call me. He was insistent that it was better for both of us to just pay out of pocket for the mailbox, sending me links to companies that could fix it for $500 and demanding I go on a date with him so I could give him the cash for the repair and he could feed me. I don't know what his deal with the food was. I declined everything, but started to get annoyed by his constant texts and calls. Finally, after two days of it with my responses only, please contact my insurance. I sent him a text saying that he was harassing me. I blocked him, but he made a new number and threatened to report it as a hit and run to the police. I'm in law school, okay, this wasn't a hit and run. I blocked the second number. Then he used a new number to ask me if I wanted him to send a screenshot or video of the accident to his insurance. I admit, this made me angry I called this number and dug my nails so hard into my thigh I drew blood as he threatened reporting things, asking me on a date, and trying to entice me to just pay cash. I finally screamed, don't contact me again, you f inbred piece of s. My dad heard me and was upset I said that to someone I was in an accident with. 
and that I said that to a guy who thought I was cute and just wanted a date. I blocked the third number. Next day, he reaches out again to tell me I gave him the wrong policy number. I told him I didn't. He then said it'd be easier to pay cash, that I was the problem, etc. He was talking to his insurance, I guess, and began trying to validate my info. He had my mom's name, address, and phone number. I verified it, told him to not contact me again, and blocked his new number. Next morning, super early, I get a text basically saying he finished the claim and I was awful for making it harder than it needed to be by going through insurance and not going on a date with him. He then included, you're so beautiful and ugly at the same time. Don't take risks, stay on the good path. Goodbye. At this point, I got scared. Fifth number blocked. Then at midnight, he texts, you up. I know where you live. Don't try and screw me over on insurance. I'll report it as a hit and run. You should have just gone on a date with me. I took the phone to my dad, showed him the texts, and filled him in. My dad, a pretty scary dude, then calls the guy. He answered, shoot, I knew you were into me. Want to come over? My dad got very mad. My dad said this was beyond harassment. This was his final warning to not contact me, that we didn't care how he reported it, etc. Robert began saying I came on to him and offered sex as payment, invited him to my house, and was a horny bee. Instantly blocked, police contacted, insurance notified, all the things. Next day, talk to insurance, protective order filed. Get another text telling me I shouldn't have involved police. Block seventh number, notify police, go to stay at my dad's because dude doesn't have this address. My dad is a very tall, very scary dude who loves his Second Amendment. Late last night, watching Star Wars with my dad and older brother, doorbell rings. Dad goes to see who it is, and it's Robert with a trash bag filled with things I left at his house. I call the police, my dad goes ballistic, all the things. Police come, arrest guy. The bag. Lingerie, a knife, lip balm, and a Dita Von Tess fetish book just met with an attorney. Plot twist. Guy doesn't own the house, is an illegal immigrant, is married, and is being deported. I feel awful he's being deported. I genuinely think he wanted to s assault and or kill me. I go back to school in a few days and am so terrified he or someone else will follow me. VTA. I have kept my friend his neighbor informed through whole process. He hasn't reached out to her except for video of me backing into the mailbox. I don't know if an illegal immigrant can be charged with crimes, but he was arrested for stalking, trespassing, felony assault he tried to push my dad, and then spit at him. Insurance fraud he lied about the accident to his insurance agent. Possession of a deadly weapon with intent the knife in the bag and attempted breaking and entering. They just kept adding on the charges, lol. After college, I moved a lot, so it took me some time to figure things out. And finally, after a few months, I rented an apartment. The place wasn't big, it was small but good. However, for me, it was the best thing ever I had. It felt really good because now I had something that was truly mine, and it made me feel proud just when I needed to stay happy. Well, technically, I was renting, not owning, but you know, for that month after paying, it felt like it was mine. I had it all to myself for 30 days. Not everyone understood why this meant so much to me. I lived by myself now and didn't have friends because I didn't want any. My life was easy. Everything was about my job and being by myself. That's all I wanted, so why should I need any friend? But one night after work, I was searching for my keys in my purse. That's when I heard a soft whisper like someone talking. I turned around, but there was no one there, so maybe my ears were playing tricks on me. I kind of pushed away the thought and went inside my apartment. The voice was gone, so I thought it was just me hearing things. I sat on my couch, thinking about what my co-workers said at work, as they often asked why I kept to myself most of the time. Even though I've been working there for more than a year and seven months, I haven't really had a good talk with anyone. Of course, I couldn't say to them that I like being by myself and don't really want them around. 
So I just said to my work buddies that I enjoy thinking a lot. That's it. I even made up some stuff, like I write books in my free time, and it keeps me busy. They just got the idea that I like being on my own, and that was fine with me. Sometimes I'd stay out later than I had to. I'd leave at 2 in the morning and come home really late. It's not like I had a ton of stuff to do, but I just needed that time for myself. Even though people didn't really believe what I told them, nobody asked too many questions. I ran into Paul a few times in the hallway. He's my neighbor. He always had a smile on his face, so I figured he was a pretty happy guy. We chatted a couple of times, but it was just about everyday stuff like what you say to neighbors. But I got a bit friendlier with someone from work when I found out she liked a song from my favorite band. And by friendlier, I mean we talked for five minutes instead of one. We began talking and became fast friends. After a month, I asked Sarah to come over to my apartment. Turns out her roommate needed a place and Sarah didn't have another spot to stay. So even though I wasn't too sure, I said she could stay with me until she figured things out. The next day we got to my place, but when I tried opening the door, I heard those whispers again just like last time. It gave me a bit of a shiver, but I tried not to let it bother me. Unlike me, Sarah was curious about the sound. Did you hear that? Sarah asked while we were outside my apartment. Hear what? I asked, pretending like nothing happened. Just listen, she said. So we both waited there. It was again. It wasn't scary or anything. It felt like someone was trying to say something, but we couldn't figure out what it was. I looked at Paul's place and wondered who he was whispering to. I thought he lived alone, but that's the issue. Sarah and I were pretty sure that the whispers were coming from his apartment. We heard those whispers again, but we couldn't understand what they were saying. Your neighbors are strange, she said. We went into my apartment, had dinner, and laughed about silly stuff at work. She asked if I had a boyfriend, and I said, no, I don't. She responded, I kind of thought so, but that's okay. After chatting for a while, we fell asleep on the couch, leaning on each other. I know it might sound strange, but Sarah was one of those folks who made it easy for me to talk. She made me feel at ease and friendly. It brought back memories of a close friend I had in high school named Evelyn, and we were practically like roommates back then. I noticed a bit of Evelyn in Sarah, and it made me feel a bit emotional. Sarah left the next day early in the morning. When we woke up since I had the day off from work, I thought I'd just chill. There was a knock on my door that brought me back to reality. I thought about not answering for a moment, hoping the person would go away. I had dealt with enough people for one day. Even though Sarah had made a good impression, I felt tired. Talking so much and being around someone for almost 15 hours wore me out. But the knocking didn't stop, so I got up and opened the door. It was my neighbor. He seemed upset about something, but I didn't know what it was. Hey, sorry to disturb you, but I wanted to say you were kind of loud with your friend last night. It would be great if you could keep it down next time. I don't like noise, his voice was almost a whisper, similar to the voices I heard last night. He sounded a bit annoyed and upset, that much I could tell for sure. Ah, uh, sorry about that. I'll try to be quieter next time, I said with a smile. I saw a frown on his face turn into a smile right away. Thanks, he said, and then he went back to his apartment. I just shook off the idea that he was acting a bit strange. Sarah and I were actually quiet last night, but it's all good. A whole week went by after that talk. Things stayed pretty much the same. Every day had the usual routine, but it felt a bit off whenever Paul knocked on my door. I felt anxious and uneasy, like there was something watching me from behind, waiting for me to do something not usual. I was sitting at my desk when someone stood by the front door knocking. I pulled myself off the chair and opened the door, and again it was Paul, but this time he looked strange. His hair was all messy, and his eyes seemed like they might pop out at any moment. Can you please stop all that talking? I can't, I can't focus because of them. I don't know what you're doing, stop it. Paul turned and walked away, leaving me surprised without a chance to reply. The sarcasm was gone now, it was just pure anger. I don't really like being bothered about things I'm sure of, 
that I thought about telling the landlord about him a few times, but then I remembered he lost his wife and kids, so maybe he's still feeling really sad. But one night, when I came home from work late, opened my door, and heard those whispers again. I was curious about what they were saying this time, so I checked it out. I put my head on the door to his apartment and listened. She killed her. She is evil. I can't do anything because no one would believe. Dennis killed Carla. I quickly moved away from the door. My breathing was fast. My mind told me to run. I wanted to, but I also wanted to find out more. Denise told everyone it was an accident, but I know it's not. She pushed Carla off the cliff and Carla couldn't swim. No, I whispered. It felt like he heard me because the whisper stopped. I heard footsteps coming to the door, so I rushed into my apartment. Denise was my name. Carla was his wife who passed away. Paul knocked on my door. Too scared to do anything, I ran into the kitchen and hid under the table. Denise, can we talk? He called, his voice sounding serious. I was still shaking, scared, and really confused. What should I do? I heard my front door open. I forgot to lock it. Oh no, I felt so dumb. The door squeaked open, and he peeked into the room, looking around carefully before stepping inside. I could see him from my spot in the kitchen, but I knew he couldn't see me because I was hiding low down. There were a bunch of boxes on either side under the kitchen table, giving me cover. I heard the floor creak as Paul stepped into my apartment. I stayed still. I knelt there, scared and frozen under the kitchen table. All of a sudden it got quiet and I couldn't see him anywhere. The next thing I knew, he grabbed the edge of the table I was hiding under and tried to pull it aside. So it was you, right? Paul asked, not paying attention to anything else, and his eyes were locked onto mine. What do you want? I asked, trying to move away from him, but I had no place to go. You killed my wife, didn't you? He asked me, with a mix of sadness, anger, and regret in his voice. I shook my head, saying no, but he came closer. Finally, I started moving back, trying to create space between me and this angry man. You said it was an accident, he yelled. Terrified for my life, I was figuring out what to do next as he came closer slowly. My wife didn't deserve to die. You were supposed to protect her. How could you do such a thing? Stop making excuses. Do you think you're some kind of saint? I whimpered at the sound of his voice. His intense stare paralyzed me. I couldn't make any sudden moves. That's why you ran away from your family. You wanted to escape to a place where no one knew what you did, but I won't let you. Then Paul picked me up and threw me across the living room. I fell on my side and pain shot through my whole body. I tried really hard to breathe. When I sat up, I saw him coming towards me again. Then why did you run away if it was an accident? You shouldn't be here. His words hurt like a sharp knife, stabbing my heart, and I knew he believed every word he said. I had nothing to protect myself with except my hands. I couldn't even fight back if I wanted to. As he came closer, closer, leaning forward, the space between us disappeared. His big hands grabbed my neck, and he started trying to squeeze and bang my head against the wall. With all the strength I could find, I leaned my body into him. I bit his arm until he let go, and I tried to run away, but before I could reach the front door, he grabbed my shirt and threw me into the living room like an empty bottle. But this time, I hit my back on the shelf. I was sure I had a few more broken bones. The pain was too much. I didn't mean to hurt her, I said. She was my best friend, I cried, pretending like I did it. This was my last chance to survive. I was in so much pain, begging him with everything I had to stop hurting me. Paul looked at me, but before he could do anything, I saw him get tackled to the floor. In a split second, I could see in his eyes that he believed me when I admitted and pretended I was the one who killed his wife. I said sorry and used my pain from the broken bones to cry a little more. I didn't recognize who tackled him, but someone else joined and kicked the knife out of his reach. The second guy lifted me off the floor, helped me stand, and pulled my hands behind my back as he guided me out of the apartment. 
It turns out, since the door was left open, some of the other people who live in the building heard what happened. They heard me screaming, crying, and begging for help. Someone did come to help. Two other guys subdued Paul while I was carried out of my apartment. I could hear groans and grunts as they struggled with him. After that, the medic showed up. Everything became a blur and I was in a lot of pain so they gave me gas to make the pain go away. My whole body felt numb. I needed several operations because of my broken bones. My neighbor Paul, who acted crazy, was put in a mental hospital. It turns out he had severe problems with his mind like schizophrenia, delusions and trouble controlling his. I had a next door neighbor who was just downright mean. Our house was a double block, so we had the next door neighbor who was actually next door on the same street, and then another neighbor who we shared a fence with but her house was around the corner. And this lady was just mean. Often I would hear her screaming at her toddler like three, four years old that she is worthless and pathetic. I also had some pet chickens, and I kept the wings clipped but chickens will be chickens and sometimes got over the fence into her yard. Normally I would run around, collect the chook and come home. Like these were pets you would walk up, and they would just look up at you waiting to be picked up and cuddled. One day before I could get around to her house to get the chook, she just let her dog out on it. You could hear the dog ripping this poor little chook to death. It was horrible. In front of her toddler, no less. She then started screaming that if it ever happens again, then she will put the dog into our chicken run to kill all our chooks. We then put a higher bid on the fence. After this incident, I also started using the fence between our properties to practice my hockey serves grass hockey. I mean, I was nine and pissed this lady killed my pet. My mum didn't mind the dents in the fence, and since it was one of those color bond things, it made a hella of a noise which she would have hated since she was a stay-at-home mum, and at her house 99% of the time. So also I had this grumpy old cat, and he went missing. Two weeks later we found him dead in her front yard, all skinny like he had been starved. So yeah, if that lady killed two of my pets. So, this is a story of how I was probably almost as assaulted and never realized it until about 15 years later. We had neighbors up the street, and when I was a kid, their son probably teenage. I honestly don't remember would sometimes come and babysit or keep an eye on me while my parents were out. Not a big deal or a formal thing, but just someone to keep an eye on an 8-year-old for a few minutes. Well, at some point I was telling him about a club that my friends and I from school had, and he started talking about the cooler older kid clubs there were. One of which apparently involved tickling each other's butts. I was kind of weirded out by it, but eventually he talked me into tickling his give me a break. I was really young and not even remotely aware of sexuality while he was still dressed as a warm-up sort of thing. I must have mentioned something to my parents about it at some point, because after that I never saw the kid again. It was the kind of thing I randomly remembered like 15 years later during a slow night at work, and realized that if I hadn't said anything or had been just a bit more gullible, I might have had an entirely different childhood. So for any younger Redditors out there, if you've got a neighbor of friend or family member that wants you to do something that feels weird or uncomfortable, just mention it to your parents. Might be nothing or might save your life without realizing it. Mostly the man who kept walking into my driveway to check my inspection stickers on my vehicle so he could report me. He did it on the antique car all the time and I constantly had to remind the complex that no, I am not obligated to explain how antique vehicles work regarding inspection. You as my landlord are responsible for telling him when he calls you every day to report me. The proper response is to not call me when I haven't done anything wrong. I guess he was retired and had nothing better to do. He also followed me home one night, blocked me in my driveway and told me I wasn't welcome to live here. That was the first night we ever encountered each other. He claimed I was speeding at five miles per hour. MK. At another house, a lady a few houses down was mentally unstable. 
She threatened another neighbor with a knife screaming about him murdering her plants because he was mowing his lawn. The cops were called nearly every week. I felt really bad for her. She probably needed to be institutionalized or put in a home where she could be supervised. He was mid-thirties, unemployed, lived with his girlfriend in the house next door, and was a tweaker who had been in and out of jail. He was a rabid white supremacist despite acting like a gangsta and listening to rap music 24-7 and had been kicked out of both the KKK and the Aryan Nation because of his drug habit. His girlfriend was half Mexican. He had a KKK logo tattooed on his arm. One time, when I was about 12, we came home from vacation. One of our windows broken, and he was asleep on our couch. The whole house reeked of a smell like burned cat piss, probably meth. I guess he didn't pay the power bill and didn't have any air conditioning or TV, so he decided it would be a good idea to break in our house and use ours. He didn't steal anything except a few beers and some food out of the fridge, so we decided not to call the cops and my dad just gave him a long talk about getting his shit together and offered to help him get a job, which he declined. That was a mistake. He eventually got a job at Taco Bell and was fired three weeks in for showing up to work high. He tried to sell me and the other neighborhood kids drugs when we were as young as 11, and I guess that was his primary source of income. He had groups of people showing up at his house at all hours of the night and never staying very long, so I suspect they were customers. He went to jail for a while for drug possession when I was about 14, got out about 18 months later. We also suspect he stole cars since he occasionally had one or two under tarps in his backyard. He probably beat his girlfriend. We never heard it, but she was always covered in bruises. He liked to hang out in his backyard and try to talk to me when I was outside playing or whatever when I was a kid. He also creeped around the local middle school. He'd hang out in the parking lot and whistle at girls and make sexual comments. I thought it was just a little bit creepy when I was 11, 13, but I didn't realize just how messed up it was at the time. There were also occasionally young teenage girls at his house when his girlfriend was at work around that time. He said they were his nieces and tried to get me to come over and play with them, but now I doubt it. Never saw their parents, and they were always gone before his girlfriend got home from work. About a year ago, a whole bunch of cops raided his house and took him, his girlfriend, and young woman about 19 or 20 years old who I'd never seen before out in handcuffs. Haven't seen any of them since, don't know what they were arrested for. Most of the trouble neighbors have just been violent, but I guess the creepiest one would be when I was a kid growing up in a block of council flats. Our neighbor was a drunk woman who lived with her boyfriend, seemed harmless if completely weird and off her tits on cider at all times. Then one morning me and my little sister have to go to school via the fire escape and the hallway smelled funny, especially around the rubbish chute. Turns out they had turned on each other, and she had stabbed him to death before trying to get rid of the body. Luckily, my mom was able to use this as fodder to get us into some nicer housing. I was five, and he lived down the street from me. It was a longer street, so not a direct neighbor, but he was a school teacher who was linked to the murder and abduction of a few kids. I remember coming home to cops everywhere and our street shut off. Next thing I remember is them excavating his house. Fast forward to now and he's on trial for the murder of a little girl who went missing from our area when I was in primary school. Always gives me the willies when I think about walking past his house on the way home from school. I lived in a very remote area. No cable, dial-up internet until 2010, no public transit, etc. All us kids who grew up out there were a little strange, but there was this one guy who put us all to shame. He always seemed a little slow. He was about seven years older than me, but would come over to play all the time when my younger sister and I were really little. My parents took pity on him, I guess. Also, this being the late 80s, early 90s, things were a little different. 
we were free-range kids. He used to shit in our yard all the time, and my parents used to joke about it. To be fair, it was the bushes we all pooed outside, but usually not in our neighbor's front yards. The last straw, the reason he wasn't allowed to come over anymore, was one day he punched me in the face, I'm a girl, stole our kitten, rode off down the road on his bike, and abandoned the kitten in a ditch beside the road. My older sister just happened to see him take the cat, followed him, and rescued her from the ditch. My sister told our parents, and the neighbor was banned. One day, when I was about seven, I went for a walk with my dog down to the beach and back. I kept having this weird feeling I was being watched, but ignored it, as I didn't see anything out of the ordinary. When I was almost home, creepy teen neighbor popped out of the bushes beside the road. He told me he had been following me the whole time. He said he was in a special club, and each person picked a girl to essentially stalk. I was his subject. He said he peered in our windows after dark and watched my family going to the bathroom. We had a window in our bathroom in the shower. To this day, I have a hard time going to the bathroom with the shower curtain open anywhere. My parents replaced the window with opaque glass blocks, but I still get the heaves from that window. He said he was going to make me his. I told him to suck it and stomped home with my dog. I don't remember if I told my parents, but I don't think so. I can't remember much about how the attack started. I only have fragmented memories of different sexual assaults happening in various places. The woods, my backyard, near the beach. I do remember one time in this fort he had on his property, but don't remember how I got there. There was one instance involving a badminton racket and my ass. He told me if I told anyone he'd get my little sister, but he ended up doing some stuff to her too. Before it got as bad as what happened to me, we told our parents, but anything like that is too much. Nothing was done. I don't know why the cops weren't called when I showed up with a bleeding butthole. All I can say is it was a huge fail on my parents and the authorities' behalf. I think I remember something about my mom going to talk to his mom, and his mom saying we made the whole thing up, but I don't know if this is true or not. The whole thing got swept under the rug, and weirdly, I forgot it ever happened. I didn't start getting flashbacks until puberty. When my sister and I were in our early 20s, she and my parents had a drunken heart-to-heart -heart about it, and there was weeping and gnashing of teeth. I was so pissed. How could they do nothing, then years later act all shocked about the whole thing? Once, when I was about 23, my mom got sucked into this landmark conference thing through her work. That night, she called me out of the blue. She told me about her creepy uncle and how he tried to molest my mom, but my mom scared him off, so he went after my aunt instead. The family swept it all under the rug and my aunt became a teenage heroin addict. By this time, my mom was crying, saying, I swore to myself then, if anything like that ever happened to my kids, I'd kill the bastard who did it. At the time, I was livid. I mumbled by and hung up and didn't talk to my parents for another six months, drowning my sorrows in my own scorching heroin addiction. Now I like to think it was her roundabout way of apologizing, maybe? I'd hate to think otherwise that my mom could be so blithe and clueless. I finally kicked my habit for good two years and three months ago. Things are pretty good with my family. I had a good upbringing other than that and my parents did the best they could. I'm lucky compared to some people I know. We're all way closer now. I don't know what happened to the creepy neighbor. Last I heard he had moved to an even more remote location. The statute of limitations ran out years ago anyway. I forgive him because I choose not to carry that baggage around anymore. He's the one who has to live with himself. Thanks for listening. If you like our work, do subscribe because your support helps us keep this channel alive.